Hi, welcome. Sorry to have my back, Keith. That's just <laughs> Katie. Is, uh, welcome, everybody. We're so glad to have you. I'm Catherine Wygant Fawcett, the Executive Director of the Institute for Family Owned Business, otherwise known as IFOB. Um, it's great to have you all here in person, and welcome to the people in Zoom. I think they're the camera following right here. So, um, Brooke. Um, we have Brooke Stewart, our Director of Communications here. She's our tech expert. She'll be our moderator in the chat. And she's asking me to have people take their cameras off and mute. Is that what we Keep mean? the cameras off and on and stay on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the cameras are. off, stay on mute. But when you want to ask questions, you can put it in the chat to Brooke. So we'll be recording this program for later viewing and sending contact information and things out from us. Um, we'd like to thank Seth Weber and his team for Barry Dunn for hosting us in this lovely space here. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors, Cam Shorey, who's down here from the Breakwater Group at Morgan Stanley, Debbie Bing, and Caitlin Russo. Yep. <laughs> there we go. There you are from CFAR, Crystal Hall and Hannah Ledecky from the Better Business Bureau and Maine Biss. And in a few minutes, they'll come up and say a few words. Um, as many of you know, the IFOB is a nonprofit that helps family businesses succeed as they fuel a local economy. This year, we're celebrating our 30th anniversary. It's 10 years for me and going on six years for Brooke, so we're excited to do that. And I met Ted when I was very green 10 years ago, <laughs> and he uh, he was very welcoming, and I'm really pleased to have him here today because uh, you'll hear that Ted has run a family business center at Northeastern. So um, we're offering over 50 programs. I have my famous little hierarchy that everybody <laughs> is my Bible of all our different programs. Um, and if you don't have it, Brooke can send it to them on Zoom. The green programs are for all your employees and everyone. Green is good, pink is for the ladies, and um, tan are for our peer groups that we have. So we're working on two more of our how-tos. We have two little boxes there. Those are gonna be great programs. We also have our wine and nine where we teach women how to play golf. We've um, often had it at Nunsuch, but this year we're gonna change it up a little bit. We're gonna to go to Sunset Ridge and then we have 20 to 40 women who come, some <laughs> who know how to play and some don't. If you don't, it's a great way to learn. If you're really good, you have some more instruction and have some fun and then we're gonna, we talked to our programming committee yesterday because some people, we let the guys in and some of them want an 18 hole and some of them we want a nine hole. So I said, well, why don't we do both? And everybody's like, what are you crazy, Catherine? I'm like, no, no, I talked to the golf pro. I think we can probably figure that out. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that and have a barbecue at the end. So that starts May 21st. There'll be six weeks of instructions for the, for the women. And then we'll let the guys in on July 9th. So that'll be fun. Um, many of our educational programs are held right here, and we're going to have, um, let me see, we have, this. it's our seventh annual scramble, so that'll be fun. So we're working on our family business spotlight. We haven't done this in <laughs> where we go visit our family business and learn all about them and have some nice networking and good food. And our peer groups are started. So we have CEO Centro, we have Women's Leadership Forum, we have Net <laughs> And tomorrow we have our EOS Think Tank that we're starting with Laura McDowell here. Um, today we have our second program in our How To's educational series called Your Family Business's Resiliency Depends on Its Structure. So we have Ted Clark, the director of the Center for Family Business an executive professional professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Northeastern University. And here is his book. And you may have seen those out front. He's offering a 20% discount to all of you. If you want it, I have read it. It's very interesting and very good. Uh, and then we have Debbie Bing, the president and principal of CIFAR, a family business specialist here. She's on the end. <laughs> and then we have um, our great next gens who've been involved with this for a long time. We have Kim Wallach, president and franchise owner of the Wallach Group. She represents the solely owned family business on the second generation. We have Joe Composa, he's our new, he's our new boss. He's the board chair with the yeah. IFOB and he is the president of Composa Floor Covering Center and Old Port Specialty Tile. They have sibling owned, so we have Tia Green and Katie Composa. Uh, Tia is the VP of commercial uh, 
Vice President Capoza for covering handle commercial and residential. And, residential manager. and then we have uh, Katie, who is the Vice President of Oakport Specialty Talk. So she's here as well. We have we would have had Clara Collins and Adam Collins here in Caribou. They're getting 10 inches of snow and high wind. So they said, I think maybe we're not going to make it down, but they're going to come on Zoom. They're on. So yeah. they're on Zoom. So we'll have them in here as well. Clara Collins is operations manager of SW Collins Company. She represents the Diffuse. They're the sixth generation with her. Store. And the store, Adam is a store manager, SW Collins. So they're both cousins. And um, Fun. Shall we tell them the fun little story? Sure. Uh, that Clara was uh, one of Ted's students. So we're going to hear her perspective. The, the lie. I always tell people that we like to have the best practices, and then we bring in the family businesses to tell their experience. <laughs> now we have a new one. We can have the student hear what the student learned <laughs> and bring in the best practices that she's learned. Um, after this session, we're going to have our How to Develop a Board of Advisors workshop with Ted Carr, also author of the book, and Ted Knowles, who's here with us. Um, and that's going to, we're going to have to scoot over to two rooms and be cozy because uh, Barry Dunn actually has more people coming into this room now. Um, that's also a 20% discount, if you will, like on that book. So we'll have that coming up. And towards the end of the program, we'll be handing out our surveys. We really appreciate you doing that. We have some door prizes for those of you here. It helps us figure out our programs each year. And now I will invite Cam and then Crystal, and then we'll turn it over to Debbie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, girl. I'll get everybody from here. Um, Cam Shorey, my partner with Gary Bergeron, a new board member this year, for I, Bob, and Jane Stevens, who run a family advisory investment management practice at Mount Salem. Uh, uniquely, we were all in small business, grew up in small business. I'm still involved in my family shoe business business in Lewiston and more of an advisory capacity. It's been more work than anticipated in my own <laughs> career. Um, but needless to say, this work's really important to us and feel grateful to be a part of bringing involved everybody at the source. So thank you. Hi, my name is Crystal and I'm the main community relations and event marketing specialist along with Hannah with the Better Business Bureau. Our branch serves all of Eastern Mass, Maine, Rhode Island, and Vermont. It's a pleasure to be here with everybody this morning. We are a 112 year old nonprofit that serves as a precautionary tool for businesses and consumers alike. Um, we like to serve our community and support in any way we can through sponsoring, volunteering, and participating in events like this. We did stick a resource card and brochure in front of everybody to look at at your convenience. We look forward to speaking with everyone today and thank you for your time. Great, okay, so I'm gonna kick us off. So I'm Debbie Bing. Um, I am the president of CIFAR, which is a consulting firm. We've been working with family businesses for over 37 years now, so a long time. We've seen lots of stuff. We work on the issues of sort of succession and ownership and leadership transition and next-gen engagement and strategy and culture, all of the easy stuff, right? I think actually, Cam, it's a good, good sound bite for today, which it's more work than anticipated, right? So we're gonna hear from our panelists, lots of versions of that. I'm sure you have your own lived stories about that. So we're excited to be here, both as a sponsor of this great program and also to help moderate this fantastic panel. Um, the way that we're gonna do this this morning, and we hope it will be very interactive with all of your voices actively in this conversation, we'll quickly go down and have the panelists introduce themselves. I'm gonna ask you all, including Clara and Adam on Zoom, to just, Tell us what your business is and um, for starters, something that you're really proud of about your family business. And we'll get into some of the, you know, both sides of the coin stories later. Then we're going to hear from Ted Clark to put some ideas about sort of the theme of the program, structure matters and why. And he's got some thinking there for you all to react to. And then we'll come back to the panel and really hear sort of the stories, uh, you know, from the lived experience and how do those interact with the theory. We're, we're open to questions all along the way, but we also have lots of time at the end for an interactive discussion with all of you. And we'll, we'll obviously get the questions from Brooke via Zoom. So don't feel shy with the chat. Sound good? Just remember to speak loud enough so I can hear you on uh, Zoom too. Yeah. Okay. And let us know, folks on Zoom. Mm -hmm. You know, message Brooke. <laughs> Let us know if we need to speak louder or use the microphone. 
Okay, great. So we're going to do quick introductions and then we'll land with Ted who will take us into some of the content for today. So Kim, can we start with you? Sure. Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you guys for coming. My name is Kim Wallach. Um, I am the president of the Wallach Group. Uh, we are we were start we started in Maine in about 1975. Um, I'm a second generation, we're sole owned. Um, and uh, we are probably better known as a Duncan franchise owner. Um, we also have a commercial real estate development um, side of our business as well. So we have about 100 locations, um, starting in Maine, spanning into New Hampshire, and a lot in upstate New York. Um, currently, I'm the I'm the president. Um, I think I've mentioned I'm second generation. Um, my father is also still very heavily involved as the CEO. Something you're proud of. Something I'm proud of. Um, uh, as I mentioned, we are um, we started as a Duncan franchise owner in in 1975. So for any of you guys who might remember uh, Duncan back when they were younger, things have changed a lot. Um, so we've been able to morph our business and stay alive and really become um, a, a longstanding profitable franchise owner that um, a lot of the actual Inspire brands uses as a um, benchmark for other franchise owners that grow. So thanks. Okay. <clears throat> I am Tia Green, and I'm the Vice President of Capoza Floor Covering Center and Oakport Specialty Tile. I'm also the Residential Manager, um, and I am probably most proud of uh, two things. One is that we are owned and operated, um, operating owners, and um, the other thing is the growth that we've had under the third generation. Um, I'm Joe Capoza, and... I am the president at Composer Flooring and Oldport Specialty Tile. Um, so we're third generation family business, and this is our 50th year. Um, and we we did the ownership transition in 2022. Um, and something I'm proud of in our 50th year, um, we're taking it as an opportunity to, um, we're doing an event in October, and we've had vendors uh, sponsor the event and donate $25,000 to the Barbara Bush Children's Hospital and um, MCCP. And then we're matching that and donating 25,000 as well to do 50,000 for 50 years. So um, I'm proud that we're able to do that as a company. I think that's uh, something that way back to the, I think the nineties is when we started donating um, to the, to the hospital and uh, to be able to do that at 50 years. I think it's pretty cool. I'm Katie Capoza. I am vice president of the company. With Joe, with Joe and Tia, but my day-to-day -day is running Old Port Specialty Tile, which is another branch of our business. Um, I would say what I'm most proud of is that, uh, you know, we've been able to navigate and all of us stay together, um, keep everybody together. We've got many families that work for us and a great culture, you know, within both of the stores and the company. Can we go to um Clara and Adam on Zoom. Hi, I'm Clara uh, Collins, Estee Collins Company, part of the sixth generation and our operations manager. Uh, one of the things that I am most proud of of our company is how, I mean, our part of our mission is we're centered around serving our communities and by the people that we have working for us and the teams that we have at all our locations, we have been able to support numerous large and small projects in our communities um, to help build better places to live for everybody. Great, thanks. Adam? Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Adam Collins. I'm Clara's cousin, a part of the sixth generation um, of SW Collins Company. Uh, I manage one of our locations in Northern Maine in the uh, Presque Isle office. Um, and I think one thing I'm most proud of is just our uh, commitment to customer service. I know that can be a <laughs> shay nowadays, especially in retail, but that's really what we've been known for for as long as we've been around, which is we're celebrating our 180th year this year. Um, if you go into any one of our locations, we strive to have the same experience for every customers. And uh, that's basically if you're a customer, you're walking through the door, you're getting greeted. Uh, we're going to have a very close hands on approach with you and making sure we're taking care of uh, everybody in our community with um, any one of their plumbing, electrical or uh, any problems that they have. So that's something that we've uh, really dedicated our focus around and our, um, you know, our commitment to our communities. Great. Thanks. So it's no accident. We've got 
sort of three different stages of structure and ownership model here. So we're going to get back to that and the kind of differences between these experiences. But Ted, uh, over to you. Uh, I'll stand up because I feel like I'm in the classroom right now for some reason. Um, so a couple of comments. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Catherine and Brooke for having us here. I really appreciate the opportunity and I'm really happy to see everybody and happy to see uh, Clara again. I haven't seen her for a while. She was in a class and she was like, get a Give her a little plug. She was an awesome student. So, <laughs> so we're going to talk about uh, what, what I think makes family businesses unique. You hear a lot of stuff about they're unique for this reason and that reason. They have all these strengths. But it's really hard to figure out why they're unique. And I think I figured it out. And, and I got to say, everything I've learned about family business, I would dare say I've learned from family businesses. So I think these kind of, these kind of organizations like IFOB, any place you can get together with a group of family businesses, you will learn more from them because they're living that experience than you will learn anywhere else. There's no books out there that can bring you the kind of information and knowledge that a group like this has. Peer groups are incredibly powerful. If you're not in a peer group, you should get in a peer group of family businesses. They're incredible. I've learned more from peer groups and Debbie and I have, and, Kate, and Caitlin and I have been in peer groups together with family businesses. You learn more from them than you will learn from anybody else. And you will learn the, the real secrets from them because they're willing to share. And then, you know, you know I've, I've always made the joke, you're not going to go to a chamber of commerce meeting and really hear what's going on. But you get into a group of family businesses when they, they look around and they say, you're just like us. And they fess up and they tell you, <laughs> they tell you what's going on and how it works. <laughs> You, you really, in my opinion, should be involved in these kind of things. So having said that, everything we're talking about is theory. It's not, you know, a law, just theory and what we believe. And this is my theory. And so because it does come from family businesses, I feel very strongly about it. But if anybody has any comments, please feel free to interrupt, ask questions, throw out what, whatever you, you, know, what you want to say, whatever you think. So I'll give you some background. This will work. Um, you tried really hard to get everything set. <laughs> oh, wait. And then it doesn't work. Maybe now. Yes. So here's the panel. I'm going to start right here. Okay. So this is about resiliency, creating a resilient family business. So if you listen to some of the things that we've heard today, there's a lot of resiliency. You've got first generation, second generation, and a company that's 180 years old. They've, got to, they've had to have learned something, and hopefully they'll, they'll share it with us, and I, I think they will. What I find is to truly understand family businesses, you have to understand they're not this monolithic block. They're not all the same. If you look closely, you can start to see real changes and gradations in how they operate and what they do. So there, there's subspecies in there, and that's the point of what we're trying to get to. We're trying to figure out what's different between the different types of family businesses. So they are different. We're going to try to identify three types of family businesses, what makes them different among those three types, and then how to develop a strategy for longevity and improvement within your family business. That's the goal. And so again, if anybody has any questions, please ask. We're always happy to have questions. So resilience is your, your ability to, to react, to adjust. Darwin did not say it's survival of the strongest. He did not say it's survival of the fittest. He said it's survival of the adaptable. And that's the ticket. If you want to survive, you have to adapt. And I dare say we've already heard a little bit of adaptation within the panel. There was a talk about starting as a franchise, and it was different back then. I took what I heard was we had to morph and change because we had to adapt to the environment. Otherwise, we'd just be a franchise. They're doing a lot of other things. I heard from another panel member about they're changing. They, they now have this kind of a tile business. They have all different things. They've adapted, they've morphed, they've adjusted. And my general opinion is, if you're trying to be the strongest business, 
you will fail. Because one of the things that makes you strong as a family business is also a weakness. We'll hit on that in a minute if anybody's curious on what makes you what makes you stronger and weaker at the exact same time. So the premise is you have there's dis, there's differences between you and other types of businesses. There's things that make you different, and I think it boils down to three things: your ownership structure, <clears throat> your financial structure, and your management structure. That's what makes you strong, and that's also what causes your your weaknesses. And that's where you have to adapt as you move forward through different types. So to be resilient, you have to capitalize on what makes you strong, minimize what makes you weak. So here's one of the things that frustrated me for a very, very long time. And I don't know if you guys have ever realized this, but there's no universally accepted definition of what a family business is. You'll hear they're this, they're that, or something else. There's one estimate, not one, it's very, very common. It's one of the most cited, widely cited attributes of family businesses. They make up 80 to 90% of all businesses in the United States. You got, has anybody ever heard that? 80 to 90% of all businesses are family businesses? So we hear that. Let me ask you a question. If there's 80 to 90% of you are all family businesses, and they always say you're unique, how are you unique? <laughs> It would be the 10% that are unique. So what my point is, there's a definition here, and I'd like to think I made this up, but I didn't. I took it from family businesses. First of all, they're privately owned. They're not public. They've experienced generational ownership within a family. Getting them to the second generation is fundamental. Otherwise, they're a startup. I kind of think of as startups as polywogs. They want to be frogs, but they're not frogs yet. It's kind of like being engaged and being married. You might have all the attributes and all the benefits of being of married, but if you're not married yet and you didn't go through that little process, it's not official yet. You have to get there. And it's going to be owned by one or more family members. My opinion is majority, if not entirely on for survivability. Now, so we'll look at intent. Intent is very important to become or remain. If you lose the intent, you fundamentally change how you operate. I believe that. So here's the patterns of family businesses. There's three kinds. To a single child, ownership is passed to a single child. <clears throat> This is what makes the oldest businesses in the world. Primogenitor is a transfer. He couldn't get away with it nowadays, hopefully. <laughs> but from father to oldest son, father to oldest son, father to oldest son. And there's family businesses that are over a thousand years old. That shows they're adaptable, survivable. These are, fam these are businesses that can outlast anyone. <laughs> so to one child. The second is to siblings. And we've seen there's a sibling business up here right now. They're different. They think differently. They operate differently. They have to because they're different. They're a different type of business. So third type is called diffused or diffusely. It's where it gets beyond one nuclear family. That's the key. It's now into cousins or for, further. They think differently. They act differently. They operate differently. And they, they may get to 20, 30, 40, 50 owners. So they act very, very differently between these types of family businesses. So who in here is a single child owner of a family business? Second generation, third, fourth, fourth generation. There you go, fourth generation. The message to that is it's not about generation. It's about ownership structure. Fourth generation is just a bragging right. <laughs> you get to brag about and that's what you know, the oldest family business in the United States. Anybody familiar with them? The oldest non-farm family business? Zildjian. Zildjian symbol. When 13 generations, one owner to one owner to one owner. Nothing to do with generation. It's about ownership structure. As you're the king of the world, right? <laughs> Don't you feel that way? You must. Sometimes. <laughs> so when you look at it, 
Here's the three types. Sole owner. It operates like a startup more often than not because it's an autocracy. There's one in charge. They have complete control. You get into sibling owners. It's more of an oligarchy. It has to be more managerial. And the, the, the focus and the push is often to prosper because now you have to deal with more than just one family. You've got to deal with th three families with sibling ownership. Would you agree with this? You have to deal with yes. maintaining the, the wealth that what you saw your parents grow up with three families, and you have to prosper. You have to manage it because you, you're not an autocracy anymore. You can't have one person in charge. And then when you get to the diffused ownership, the agenda is to grow, to get beyond the one generation, the two generations, the three generations. But if you have multiple owners, you have to find a structure where it's more of a democracy. You can't have the king or the queen. You can't even have the small group of three, the oligarchy, to make decisions. You might have to make it with more and more people. So it makes for a very different type of business. Any, any questions or thoughts on, on these three? Can people relate to and feel that they're in one of these categories? How many sibling-owned businesses do we have here? And your siblings, right? <laughs> and how about diffuse, sort of at the cousin stage of ownership? So that would just be the Collins then. Yeah. <laughs> Very hard business. And the reason the reasons that they, they're makes it diff difficult is because there's three things that you have to deal with: ownership, finances, and management. So how our family business is different, ownership structure. So the problem with the problem and the advantage, whenever I say problem, the other side is always advantage. It's the ability to acquire shares and ownership. It's limited. It's hard to get in, but it's also hard to get out. It's hard to often leave the family business. It's not like a, a public company where you just buy and sell shares. You walk in, you walk out, you get a vote. You, know, you, you, you often have to acquire shares through a longer process. And finances are different. The availability of funding is different because it's family money. Investment opportunities and criteria are different because you have to worry about the long-term viability of the business and the family. And management, good news, bad news, our management is different. Good news is it's family. You trust them. They know the business. They really <clears throat> understand what's happening. The bad news is it's often difficult to attract other non-family management. <clears throat> so when you compare it to other others, this is how it works. Publicly owned, you want to be an owner, you buy in. You, know, you don't want to be there, you leave. Finances, you need to raise money, you sell shares. I can't imagine too many family businesses saying, let's bring in some new owners. It's like, oh no, let's keep it, let's just keep it within the family. That's the way we want. But you get, to, you get to develop the managers over a longer period of time. And their, their agenda, hopefully, is to keep the business within the family. So what we're going to talk about is resilience. But I kind of sum it up to this, grounding, growth, and governance. And I think, I think you guys all have the slides. So I, I won't go to read all of this stuff. You can read it. But grounding is understanding where you are. You're trying to get the legacy to continue. Growth. You know, what I heard from a lot of you, especially the sec second, who's second generation, third generation, fourth generation, you've been given an advantage. You know, you're not a, you weren't a startup. You started with a head start. And that's one of the, the real advantages family businesses have. They have a head start, second, third, fourth generation. So you have to grow the business, first of all, to prosper if you have siblings as the business grows, but also to give your kids a head start. So that's an advantage. You'll have money in the business. It gets to your kids. You have to grow it for them. And that's the goal. And then you have to govern it. You have to make sure that the business works for the owners and the family and the next generation. So it's about creating a governance structure. So who's heard the term patient capital? Family businesses have that unique advantage of patient capital. Have you heard that? That only they have it? Have you heard? No? 
done a few articles and books. Somebody wrote a book on a fascinating book. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as patient capital. What you have is embedded wealth within the business. It's an advantage and a curse. Public companies invest all the time with patient capital. Otherwise, there'd be no new drugs, new technology. It's different with a family business, and they go to different places. That's what gives you an advantage. You're not trying to be the biggest and strongest. You never, my opinion is, you're very unlikely to compete with a public company because they can raise hundreds of millions of dollars. So you have to find an advantage and where to go. You go into, a, I don't know, stuff like a lumber yard, but you have that 180 year advantage. You go into a tile company. You go into the business where people will always need what, you, what you're <laughs> selling and you don't have to compete with people that can outfund you. So you have to understand your advantages and what makes you unique and be resilient within the economy. So does anybody have any questions on that? Any thoughts? Okay, well, I'm going to go back. Nuts, I've always been told you're never supposed to go back in the slideshow. People are like, oh, no, please don't do that. I'm going to do that because Debbie wanted me to put this up while she takes over. Okay, so we're going to continue the conversation by getting some lived experience into the room. And um, Kim, we're going to start with you. Okay. So um, you are at the sort of solely owned business stage, right? Yes. And Ted's offered all sorts of best practices here about, you know, grounding where you are. How do you think about your advantage of growth? What are the governance structures to put in place? But tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what works and doesn't work about best practices in real life and a little bit about your experience at this stage. Um, it just even during this introduction, I, I, I got to thinking um, when you were talking about adaptation and I would say the entire time that I've been um, actively involved in the family business. And when I say actively, like, you know, I grew up in the business. Um, I went away for many years, and then I came back into the business in an active leadership role. And there's been so much adaptation um, since the very beginning of me joining this business in a leadership role. And not just adapting the business itself, but adapting where I fit, um, how I work with my father, um, what his strengths are and my strengths are and, and how we best balance each other in, um, in, the, in the growth and the governance of the rest of the company um, as it continues on. So I think um, it, it's very clear that there's a lot of um, great best practices out there, but they're very much easier said than done when it comes to sole ownership company. So what have some of the challenges been that you're experiencing? Um, just, you know, when you're working with the family members, I'm sure everybody does. Um, everybody wants to be heard on what they feel that is the best course of action for the company to continue on. And I think um, my dad and I have spent a lot of years changing that vision, especially during COVID, like that changed everything for our company and our, our, our values and the way that we ran our company, even operationally, even management with people have changed so much. And if it wasn't for his strengths and my strengths, um, we, we wouldn't have gotten through it the way we did. Mm -hmm. um, so really at the end of the day, I think um, it, when it comes to actually moving forward beyond him eventually retiring, um, it's all about how we continue to diversify our business because we have a unique model being a franchise owner, but also a com commercial real estate developer. There's many <clears throat> ways that we could take our company um, moving forward. We can obviously continue the path that we have, which has been very successful for us. Um, but we could, you know, continue to diversify by bringing other brands on or going in a completely other di opposite direction and using the commercial real estate that we've developed in, in a few different states. Mm -hmm. Remember, Ted described the stage as an autocracy. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Not always easy to live in an autocracy. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, you know, the, the, the peer group that Caitlin and Ted run, we're, we have many at this stage and there's this like, we've worked really well together, but it's time for, you know, a switch and who has the influence over the future. Do you feel that rub in your relationship with your dad? Yeah, you know, my, my father um, is very much still, still heavily in control of the company. Um, and, but he is always, especially later um, in my career with the company, 
has listened to me more um, on my perspective, especially when it comes to the management of the company. So that's kind of what I mean by we we build on each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, we're very we're two very different people, and we see things two very different ways. But we're also um, I think that's what's made us successful almost as a board. Um, so again. I feel very much more heard um, than ever at this stage. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure that some people may come back with questions about how'd you make that happen? <laughs> <laughs> so let's bookmark that. We'll put a pin in that one. Um, um, and we're going to go, actually, I'm going to go, Joe, to you. And then to this whole sibling group, we'd like to hear from each of you. But Joe, in our prep conversations as a sibling owned group, there is a certain amount of structure that's needed to work across many households as Tim, as Ted had said. So can you tell us a little bit about the structures you've all put in place and what's working about that at the sibling stage? Yes, I, I, I would back up a little bit. One thing that we talked about in the prep call and Ted said it again, um, and it, it really like the, the catalyst to change our business really was like, okay, if there's three of us now, like if we all want a three, have a similar lifestyle that we did growing up, we're gonna have to do something different in our business. Cause my, my father was the business when he ran it, he built it into a very successful company. Um, and with all that work and, and time, it kind of was unique to us because in about 2013, he was like, Ugh, I'm done. Like, <laughs> and so, cause you know, you hear a lot of stories where like people, you know, parents will go to Florida, come back and kind of blow things up. Um, that has <laughs> yeah. not been our experience at all. And I think we've been very, fortunate because of that. That's really allowed us to, um, you know, make mistakes we needed to learn and, and grow uh, with our, with our style. Um, so that's just that, that's a very accurate <laughs> assessment of, of the sibling situation. Um, and as far as uh, what we've, you know, what we've made progress on um, in, in 2019, we started talking about the ownership transition that took us three years. Uh, we worked with, uh, we actually worked with Barry Dunn for consulting and in, in the financial side. Uh, we worked with our accountant and we worked with our lawyer to come up with a shareholders agreement um, and try to talk through as much as you possibly can. Obviously, there's some things that, you know, come up once you make the transition that we will still need to adjust. Um, but to try to set up a, an agreement so we we have certain operational structures, certain ownership structures in place, we talk through it. Um, so it's clear going into this new structure because it's, it's it's really it's not, you know, when it, from the ownership side, it's not one person making the decisions. Uh, from an operational side, we've structured it like that, um, that has the decision-making power. Um, so I think I think we've done really well um, to kind of get this off the ground. Um, as far as, I don't know if you need to ask yeah. a question. Well, let me, let's go, let's go to one of your sisters here. So Tia, because I think you're highlighting, it's important to have the structure in place. And that alone is hard work, right? We, we could ask you if you have really positive feelings coming into this very done <laughs> building or it's bringing back families, but, no, but you did it, right? Yeah. You got the structure in place. Tia, tell us a little bit about how it works among the three of you and what you've had to navigate even sort of with the structure in place. Um, I actually put a note down during the talk and I wrote pride aside. Uh -huh. <laughs> so like... Um, you kind of put your pride aside and you're in uh, as much as uh, I think like, OK, I want to make my stamp. Um, I want this to be, you know, my stamp on the business. Um, I always think about that. I'm um, working with two other people. And I think that's, you know, for me, because that's my personality. I'm like, you know, um, I, I guess a people pleaser. I'm okay with that. And I, and I just wonder if the dynamic was different or if you grew up differently in the household, if that would be a challenge. So um, fortunately, that's not a challenge. Um, there's three of us. We can, if we disagree on something, there's always um, at the moral compass that you can go back to. But I can imagine if it was 50-50, so if it was two siblings and there was an impasse, you know, I really don't know how you would navigate that. So I feel <laughs> fortunate that there are three of us. Mm -hmm. um, but I did put the note pride aside because I'm like, you know, you really do. You have to think, OK, um, let's table that or we'll get back to that, you know, when I've done my research or when I when I'm ready for it. Um, and I also always go back to that. I'm I'm 36 years old and I'm like, you know, I have time for that. Um, so I always think about like things that I will do when I'm ready. And, and I don't know if that, um, hmm. well, you know, I'm sure that, and we have little kids, little, little, 
Um, <laughs> so I'm always like, oh, you know, when the kids are in school, there'll be time for that. So I think that's something that um, where we're in the early stage, I think it's it's I think it's a good thing at this moment um, for us. But um, what was the other part? What I'm grappling with? Um, I would just well, I would just say that you know, um, it's hard to make your own stamp when there's three of you. Mm, yeah. And that's like you're describing also <laughs> just a mindset of being in it together, maybe some productive ganging up sometimes. <laughs> but um, Katie, what would you, what would you <laughs> add? Bigger, three is a good number in that way. Katie, what would you add like, about, have you had to put certain kinds of communication mechanisms in place or, you know, what are the ways the three of you have figured out? Well, um, I have a sort of a unique uh, situation where I'm not at the main <laughs> headquarters with them and I'm in a separate location mm -hmm. in um, sort of a separate business. We're still doing tile, but very different. Um, so there's things that are really good about that and I'm the middle child, so it works really well that I get to have like more freedom and independence and sort of do my own thing. And then there's also times where it's like, you know, just because they're physically in the same building can feel a little bit like, am I missing things or like, or if I want to make a decision or have ideas for just specifically the business that I'm running, I have to table those because of the way like that would affect, you know, or roll up into the strategic plan of, of the main company. So there's definitely some push and pull there where it's like, I need to know what's going on plan wise with, everything in order to insert like what I might want to do specifically for my branch. But I'd say communication, you know, and meeting and it's really the most important thing for us. And we've gotten a lot better at that over the years. <laughs> I think five or six years ago, we just didn't realize that how important that was. And we assumed a lot of assuming that the others knew, you know, everyone knew what each other was doing, but mm -hmm that's not the case. <laughs> so right, that's what we found works. So let's go to the columns is on online here and Clara, we'll go to you. So remember six generation cousins, lots of owners. Um, tell us how your story is different. What have you had to think about differently in your family? You know, what's it mean to be more diffuse, bigger, more branches? What's it look like? Yeah. So we're actually, I, I think we're fortunate. Um, our dads, when they were in the fifth gen stage, or well, they're still involved in the business, business but um, when it was just the two of them, they have four other siblings, but they've established buy-sell agreements and rules around entry into the business for ownership. Um, and we do have in place that in order to be an owner, you have to work in the business actively, like full-time. And just because you're working in the business, that doesn't automatically grant you ownership. Um, so it's kind of a protection. I have three older sisters. Adam has two older sisters. So there could have been a lot of opportunity for things to kind of get more diffused. Um, but I think we are fortunate that those formalized processes are put in place uh, because growing up, it was always, hey, if you're joining the business, it's not about you. It's not for you, kind of to Tia's point about pride aside. It's about how can you continue on that legacy and get it to that next generation so you can continue serving your community. Um, and I think kind of instilling those values and why we are in the business and why we are here mm -hmm. in us has helped. I mean, I, I knew I always wanted to come back into the business and having that expectation up front that it's not about me. It's about growing and maintaining and being resilient no matter what changes come. Um, Great. Adam, what would you add? How do you sort of make it work across cousins? And, you know, does it in fact require more structure, more voices, both who are owners and not owners? Yeah, I think it's about just having really clear communication um, and having trust in each other. So Claire and I, um, obviously we didn't grow up in the same household, but we grew up in the same town. Um, you know, grew up obviously as cousins and friends, but also have a relationship outside of work. And I think there's a, you know, a right place to talk about business. And that's obviously 
Monday through Friday, um, you know, throughout the day, but also carrying a certain level of a relationship outside of work, um, but also just respecting each other's roles. I mean, there's four of us in the business. Um, my uncle, my dad, obviously the fifth generation, like Claire was mentioning, and then Claire and I, and we all have, um, you know, we're, we're fortunate where the company is big enough where we have multiple locations and multiple needs for owners to um, focus on the business. Um, but we're still small enough where, you know, we can still collaborate um, on a day-to-day -day basis and make decisions pretty quickly um, and get each other's opinion. But I think as far as just making it work, you know, outside of an immediate family and across cousins is just trusting each other's judgment, um, respecting each other's decision. And, you know, you might not always agree, but we all know that between the four of us, we all have the, um, you know, the betterment of the business in mind that we're always going to do. It's not about us. I think I had, I wrote that down twice in the last hour. Uh, it, it's not about us and kind of like what Claire mentioned, it's about getting it to the next generation and kind of putting your pride um, to the side and just putting your full effort and ideas and uh, making sure that it's a functional family business too. I think there's a lot of family businesses that, you know, can struggle, um, you know, with relationships, especially over a lot of years. And, you know, we're four years into the four of us being heavily involved in the business right now. And um, it's gone really well, but we, we work on that. We work on our personal relationships, our decision-making, you know, how we want to improve the business, because if you're not, if you're not working on that outside of the business and thinking about that constantly, then I think over a long period of time, you can kind of see that eventually get put into the business where maybe you're not running the way you should be. We worked with a business that had many, many, many cousins and they created an event called Cousin Palooza, <laughs> <laughs> which was specifically to make sure that people had a touch point to each other that, that they could count on. And so, you know, coming up with the right mechanisms. Let's let's take a pause and sort of turn to all of you, including on, on Zoom. Um, these guys in some ways have made this like, you know, they got it handled. It's been easy, right? Not really. <laughs> but what are the questions coming up for you that you'd like to ask either generally to Ted about the ideas or any of our panelists here? Yes. I'm interested to know if any have uh, married partners involved in the business. So non-family members or family members through marriage. <laughs> my, yeah. my wife works in the company, I think, since 2017, I believe. Um, I think she's very good at what she does. Um, I think it's worked out from a family perspective. It hasn't been any different than like the three of us being siblings and her being involved. Um, as far as me at home, that's a different story. But, <laughs> but uh, no, it's, I mean, she's, she's been good at what she does. Um, it does add a different dynamic, um, but, but it's worked out. Was that a decision point? Like, was that a discussion when she entered? Yeah, we did a, we did like a, can't exactly remember. I think like we did like, a, like an interview type thing. Too. And with and mom and dad. With my, that was when my parents were more involved. Um, had mm -hmm. kind of a family meeting about it. Yeah, it wasn't just like a come on in type of situation. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that whole, because our kids are getting, you know, 13s are old. Well, 13 down to three months. But mm -hmm. um, that's one thing we don't really have in place is like a mechanism. If, if family members, children join the business, that would be yeah. probably something in the near future to. Right. So, do we have when we did all the documents and everything trying to think things or did did we put that in that she could potentially be an owner or uh or she's not no we no spouses that, right right yeah, yeah. I remember I think we did but I didn't think <laughs> I was thinking we put that in there is there more behind that question or more that more to no answer? just just interested and in, because I I know it, or we'll talk about divorce can also you know wreak havoc in a family business if partners are involved or have ownership. And uh, we did change our stance on that. Um, at one point, we did say no spouses, so working there at all. Yeah, yeah. We have we did change our stance, uh, but I think because of the contracts, we feel protected by it, mm -hmm. and that's just part of the legal. That was stuff. in our shareholder agreement um, with our lawyer. It was set up so. Uh, that we would be <laughs> protected from. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Can't do that in the business, but home might be a different. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, so right. you're on your own. <laughs> I have heard one person say who who made the similar choice in their in her family business. She she said, with all the spouses, it's our best chance of diversifying the gene pool. Right, like there's talent there, but <laughs> doesn't mean that yeah. you don't need the protections for what the. I've found. 
the positive of having her there is especially because she's in a billing because <laughs> <laughs> she really cares we've had people in the past like miss things or whatever she's, she's, she's not very, gonna miss it she's very good at what the three of us are not good at so yeah <laughs> <laughs> the teeter that's been that's been a good thing my mother used to work um oh. in our business uh and so and, and that 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 is not so anymore <laughs> say more <laughs> but they're still married um so <laughs> Uh, yeah, she, I mean, she used to do accounting um, and billing and I remember it very, very clearly growing up um, when, when she was working in the business and helping my father. Um, and throughout the years, we've had a lot of, we have, a, we even still have a lot of family members, husbands, wives that work for us. Um, but, but we do not. And my husband's even here and he, he has his own business. And <laughs> we like it that way. <laughs> Yeah, over here. Um, I'm going to flip this around, and I wonder how much you're informed by watching other family businesses. And when a business does could you, could you speak up a little bit? Yeah, you mind? How are you informed by other family businesses? Have you observed family businesses that did not make it to the next generation? And, and have you identified any particular flashpoints that make that happen? Besides nobody wanting to take it on. Chad, do you want to start? With so I, I missed part of it, but the question is, what are the flashpoints for family businesses not making it to the yeah. next gen? Yeah, that's basically it. And, and from, you know, real <clears throat> observations. Right. Oh. Um, I, I think one of the- naming names, of course. <laughs> <laughs> My general theory is that if you if you want your family business to last a very long time, you want to restrict ownership as much as humanly possible. When you get into when you get into four, five, six owners, the oligarchy, the good news is if the business has been around a long time, it's worth a lot of money. The bad news is the business has been a, around a long time and worth a lot of money. <laughs> and one of the owners wants to leave and you have to figure out how to buy them out and not destroy the value of the business. So the other, the other point is if you can get it diffused far enough so that nobody really can control it, you can run it more like, like a democracy or a republic and then people stick around because they have the bragging rights that I've got to, you know, a, a long-term business and they get a dividend. But if you look at the ones that really have problems, I always make the joke and hope, hope nobody's offended by this, but when a family business works well, you can't beat it. When it doesn't, it's great fun to watch. <laughs> and, and one of the ones that not too far from here was a, a, a little pizza place called Fan, uh, Falmouth House, House of Pizza. And it got into you know, a battle between owners and who's going to be in control. And if you can't afford to buy them out, it destroys the business. Massachusetts and even up here was a big battle was between cousins to Moolah's market basket. And it was about control. And the whole thing with Moolah's, I mean, I think he spent $4 billion to buy the business. The differential between ownership shares was 1%. So if you think about it, you had to spend $4 billion for 1%. So that's my experience. And that's two, that was two owners? It was cousins. It was two factions of the family that were fighting over yeah. who was going to be in control. And the, the good already got fired and then by the bad already. And then the good already bought, bought the bad already out for, four, I think it was $4 billion, But the differential of control was only 1%. So it's more when more than one more than more people are interested in controlling the business than even just the financial aspect. So one of the things that yes, that's what I'm saying is pride aside in those those settings. Like, right. right. And so what I heard that you guys are doing the, and and the Collins are doing is they're giving everybody an opportunity to control certain parts of the business. You have your own location. Yeah. You get to do things. Everybody's being given or being able to adapt to having an, a silo, if you will, something that they can manage and control. So it gives everybody an opportunity to be in charge for the greater good. 
that's my experience. Would you, would you agree or do you have any? Well, are you saying management control? Ownership control, ownership control financial control. But giving people management control of a portion of the business can facilitate the more board type. It could create longevity because they're all running their own thing. They're growing the business. It requires that growth. If you're not growing it, you're fighting over a diminishing pie. It gets smaller every generation as there's more, more people involved. So you have to grow the business. Or um, you have to buy people out, and that can destroy the business. And family. And family. Anyone on our panel on Zoom or here in the room, as you've worked through, you think about this question about what would lead to it not working, or you've had moments of saying, wow, if we don't figure this out, we're at risk here, or, or watching the story of, you know, a friend's business or anything like that. I can, oh, uh, I. Sorry. Go ahead, Claire. Go. Sorry, I was just going to say I have one thing from actually when I was in class with Ted that he said of there's nothing a new car can't fix when business is good and things are going great. Oh, buy a new car and they'll be happy. Everything will be fine. And that's really stuck with me and why I think it is so important to have those conversations and communicate and focus on the relationships outside of the business and inside of it because. There are times where business might not be so great and you can't just buy a new car to fix the problem. Um, so that was just my two cents from the from the class. Yeah, go ahead, um, The I was just kind of thinking about like in our situation. Um, so like I've been fortunate enough to, like I came up through our commercial division, but now I'm able to really oversee the whole company. And then also we established an LLC purchased a property, um, kind of getting into some different avenues. And sometimes in the back of my mind, I'll think to myself, geez, I'm doing all these things, you know, but we're equal owners. But then like I, when it, when you really, when I really think about it, they're both working, you know, their butts off in the stores and without <clears throat> them doing what they're doing. And then also just, uh, you know, our other people then I, I don't have those opportunities as an owner to, you know, to move diversify and, yeah. and yeah. our company. That's so it's really, and it's kind of funny because yeah, yeah. unless something really goes wrong. And employees. But, uh, and, what was I going to say? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, unless something really goes wrong, I'm shielded. Um, but yeah, like, oh yeah, that, that was, we had an issue with our field crew and our office crew um, a few years back where like, and then, you know, we'd preach to them like, you know, like with without the field installing and the office selling and purchasing and coordinating like no one's more important really like everybody you gotta you gotta all do things together there might be a perception that you're more important but really without um you know without the help of everybody that you know no matter what position position you're in you can't really um advance so we liked it yeah go ahead uh, a little bit of a different question, but in terms of big picture strategic type decisions, maybe more of a question for Composer and Collins, but um, when you're making those decisions, which will, will and know that impact any of those silos that any one person might be responsible for, is that majority rule? Is it consensus? How do you make decisions along those lines? Has to go where? Sure. Yeah, you guys can. Uh, so we have... Uh, we have a we work with an outside consultant, have a strategic plan, um, and a leadership team. So that's um, that's like company operational um, or strategic changes that we make. Um, and we do, I mean, we do that as a group. Ultimately, I would have the final say if it's like an operational decision. That's part of what we wrote into our shareholder agreement. Um, if we're making a like like purchasing the property, that like when we did that, or we're going to make a a big financial investment in the company. That's something that we would have we have to un unanimously agree on to to do that. So that's that's the structure that we had set up. That's predetermined before any of those. That, that was all part of our. That was part of the three years of back and forth with the yeah. shareholder also, agreement. If we can't all agree, or if, if we can't agree, you have final on operational. Say. Right. Yeah. Claire and Adam, do you have thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah. Okay. Um, for us, I wouldn't really say that we operate in silos. Um, and part of my role is going to all the locations and making sure that we're having consistencies and sharing best practices, but we have our executive team that is 
myself, my cousin, my uncle, my dad, and then two uh, members of our management team who have been with the company and are in more senior positions um, who we meet every other week and discuss more of the strategic challenges that we face um, or opportunities. And then we also have meetings, formal meetings, just the four family members, and then um, periodic ones throughout the year where we get together and, and discuss whether it's purchasing property or what direction we want to take certain aspects of the business. Um, so it's, yeah, I don't know if that answers the question or Adam, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, at the end of the day, I mean, there's still, um, you know, Clara's dad's the president um, and my dad's the vice president. And they're the ones who have obviously been at it for almost 40 years now. So if there is like a big decision, kind of like what Joe was saying, you know, obviously that's going to come from the top. But um, like Clara said, you know, we do meet weekly and I'd say, you know, 75% of the, you know, day to day decisions between all locations, you know, are discussed. Um, if appropriate. But at the end of the day, I think it is important for somebody to still have the final say. And obviously we have that structure um, kind of like the Capozo family has right now. There was some discussion of uh, buyout agreements. Um, what are some examples of successful and unsuccessful buyout agreements? Yeah. Um, so I think the one of the ways we think about this is you have to have a real discussion about aligning on the goals of buyout, right? Because the the I'll, I'll tell a story of an unsuccessful one where a business advised by a lawyer that may not have been the most helpful to them had them write into their bylaws that there would be any time. Um, a shareholder to want an evaluation of the company, they would they would hire three independent valuation firms. <laughs> and if there were differences between them, you know, the highest one would take so much complexity and so sort of importing the conflict into the structure that was obviously there, which is they had different views of the value of the business, often the case, that nothing could ever get resolved, right? So when the there isn't sort of a clear way to get a valuation of the business. And um, it's just a way of playing out conflict often doesn't work, right? I think that um, the question about, it has to be, uh, Ted and I have worked with, with uh, an owner that took a stance that we thought actually served them. They're now into their fifth, fourth to fifth generation that said, even though many family businesses will make the case that you should sort of discount the valuation of a business in order to sort of leave the business in good stead and let people exit, that he went from having, how many shareholders did he have? So if I'm thinking about yeah. right, what I think it was like 28. 28 shareholders, right, with small amounts of ownership. And he said, every single year, we're gonna do a market-based evaluation and we're gonna put that out to our shareholder group. And he used it essentially to shrink ownership back to a manageable uh, amount of people that had sort of real skin in the game in the business. So there's a lot in um, how close to a market value can you get without making it impossible for the business to continue because they don't have the money to make it work. Um, I mean, that's one take at least is the valuation thread. Go ahead. I'd add if, if you don't have one, it, there's, there's a couple of things that I will very strongly advocate if you don't have one you should have a board of advisors bar, bar none yep. second you should have buy sell agreements what, what i've seen is a lot of a lot of people will get into arguments because they don't really want to be there right and they don't know how to get out and when you have a buy sell agreement it's an opportunity to leave now if i want to leave i can because i know how to get out conversely if 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 you want to leave now i know how to get out and not have a conflict so you should have one I am personally kind of a fan of the discount because you didn't, if it's a second, third, fourth generation, you didn't start it. Part of it was there before you. So you, sh you should leave some for the next generation. But if you want to get out, you should be able to get out. And yeah. that's how you do it. Yeah, and uh, our panelists here, so um, have you had buyouts happen along the way? Maybe Claire and Adam, it sounds like. Has that happened along the way? For your family? 
I believe in our dad's generations, there was some consolidation that had to happen. I don't know all the details of it though. I think maybe an, uh, another take on it too is that people will often go right, right, right to the buyout negotiation, but what's behind that is the thing that has to get worked for first in, or, in order to ease the decision of a structural buyout, like that people have different views of what the business can and can't do, that they want different things for the future, that their families are in different places. And if you sort of ignore the conversations about why is this coming up, <laughs> then um, those conflicts play out through a technical process and you can get sort of mired. So in some ways, what's the framework that we're bringing into, you know, can we have an honest and candid conversation about what's in our way and is exit wanted and why? Do others in the room have experience with this that you would weigh in with here? Yeah. Can, can I ask a question? Who, whose family business does have buyout agreements, buy-sell agreements? <laughs> Who does not? It's an assignment for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> the next program. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Question. Oh, I thought there was a question. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yeah, okay. You have to be smart to understand my English. Oh, no. Instead of, so I, I'm very jealous of you. So working together and friendship are two different things. So as siblings and cousins, uh, you know, when you work together, so I said that you have to be friends. I heard that you grew up together, you were friends, but I think some people want to work together, but they are fear. If we work together as sisters or cousins, uh, our relationship can be brought or so. We can have some issues. Uh, how you can tell people who want to work together and their fear to start to work together as siblings and uh, sisters and, and cousins? What you can tell them to leave them the fear to start together? Brandon, you know, you so so well, I'm going to start with our our uh, lived experience experts here. So, anybody have trepidation about working together or worries about what could go wrong? <laughs> Growing up, we witnessed uh, my father and his brother having a huge falling out. They don't talk anymore. So, I feel like it was a terrible situation, but we learned from it, the three of us, and that's why, you know. We, I think, more than any business commitment, commit to not letting it get in the way. Mm -hmm. And I think our friendship and family. I think that, you know, you just choose to trust people. You just have to say, like, they have my best interest in mind. And we both have the same path forward. So, you know, I could choose to think that they're doing something um, you know, behind my back or that's not in the best interest of the company, but I, I choose to think that they are. Um, so every single day, um, you know, I don't control any of the finances with the company. I have to set my mind to say <laughs> they're doing what's trust, in the best interest. Yeah. It's just trust. I mean, it's blind, you know, it could be ignorant, but you have to just trust. Mm. Otherwise you're not going to move forward. I think for the families that feel like they're far from that, one question is what's a baby step, right? So is there a way to give siblings or cousins who might be afraid to work together some positive experience of interacting with each other? You know, um, we have a rule yeah. that when we hang out on the weekends, we don't talk about work. Uh -huh. And we all have kids, yeah, little that kids that hang out together. And <laughs> like, yeah. I, don't even, I don't even think about it really. I have an interesting perspective, even though I work with my father um, throughout the entire length of business, you know, he's had, he's had brothers work for him. My mother's worked for him. Um, we've had shareholders on the side and there's been times where these shareholders work right up until retirement. And then there's ones that exited early. There's been drama and all kinds of stuff throughout the years. And 
for me, um, it was very easy for me to make the decision to join the company because I saw the way that my father handled those situations. Mm -hmm. So just as you said, to have trust, um, even in those times where it's really hard um, and you have to, you know, I know the, the, the quintessential saying, pride aside, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you got to put your pride aside and know that I've seen when things go bad, how he handled things. And I know that if things went bad between my father and I, I know he would do the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, and I, I learned something very recently that says that unconditional love doesn't mean it has to be unconditional tolerance. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, I will always have unconditional love for a family <laughs> member. Um, and that doesn't mean that I have to do it side by side in business every day. But at the end of the day, we do have to always put the relationship first um, after work. We've tried to, um, <laughs> when we sit together quarterly, come up with like a five and 10 year plan. And we're like kind of nervous about <laughs> saying it out loud sometimes. But I think, you know, um, when trying to go in business with a friend or family member, if you if you put together a five and 10 in further out plan uh, that you're aligned on, you could be like, wait a minute, you know, we're not both working towards the five-year plan. And then uh, that's something we have to work on. We haven't really done that, but it's just, <laughs> Good idea. just creaking, you know? <laughs> But that's, I think that would be helpful. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Having that future outlook. That'd be the topic of next week's meeting. Yeah, I think. <laughs> well, or, or I know a family that they have at their annual uh, meeting that they pull out their goals that they agree to and you know deliberately ask them to change for any of us, yeah. right? Like that. That's it's not once and done. It's a live discussion. Yeah. To revisit because things change. Right. The vision Adapt. changes. Right. Really. Right. Like uh, do we have Brooke, anything on Zoom coming through? No questions no. on Zoom. No. Nope. We have 15 minutes. Okay, great. Got a uh, quick question, I guess, maybe for uh, the composer side. Um, you mentioned you work for this consultant on strategic planning. A lot of times, family owned business are get bogged down the day to day and they don't think about strategic planning. What, uh, which consultant I guess would you work with, but more importantly, mm -hmm. how what have they what have they done for you to to help think about that and drive that process? So so we have a cousin for everything. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a cousin salt. That is, but, but he he, uh, he worked um, I mean, he worked all over the world actually for mm -hmm. Brimstone, which is I guess it's a it's a big consulting firm. Yeah. Um, and then uh, well, he would subcontract it to us starting back in two thousand thirteen. Mm -hmm. Um, but basically, like I said earlier, like we, we were, yeah, we were, we were all just running in like everybody with a project manager, basically. Right. I mean, we weren't doing anything forward thinking. We were just dealing with what reacting, what was coming at us day to day. And that's, you know, doing okay, but we weren't going to be able to, to grow. Right. Um, so that's, that was why we started that process. What was the, what was the exact part of the question? <laughs> yeah. That, what, no, like, and what is he, I, I guess what. Disciplines is he given to you to to think about strategic oh, uh, and carving out time to so do yeah that? yeah goal yeah goal setting. like set goals for, yeah. for yourself for the company um and we and for, for you know so we do that as a leadership team for like the strategy of the company mm -hmm. I work also have worked with them over the years as a coach to set my own like how am I because I was I was a project manager how am I going to get from a project manager to managing the commercial division right. how am I going to get from managing the commercial division to the president of the company and actually acting in that role mm -hmm. and that started you know, from 2013 to really it's probably 2020, 20, 2021 that I, that I kind of got out of the, the day to day. So it's not a, it's not a quick thing. And now these, these guys are, you know, as we, as we evolve as a company, that's kind of, they're into that point where that, those are the next steps developing people. And so that's kind of what, that's where I've been helped uh, from the outside to, to kind of see how to, to create a path for that. I have to say too, like, I started when I was 20 <laughs> and, you know, it was like receptionist and, you know, just right. anything my dad needed me to do at the store. So I've done like every role at the store. That was a good way to like cut my teeth and learn the actual business. But like you said at the beginning, peer to peer groups and leadership coaching and 
really anything you can do like that. Like there's things I might've learned 10 years ago that didn't make sense to me 10 years ago that like now I'll remember and it's like an mm -hmm. aha moment. So mm -hmm. like all of those things that may not be literal to your job, I think are even more important once you start getting up, you know, into trying to become more of a leader, manage people and different personalities and do the strategic planning. I think the strategic plan, like we were talking about silos and you feel like you own something, that's helped me because I've had like parts of the strategic plan that I'm in charge of. And so I'm like, okay, that is my baby. You know, I may not run the whole company, but I run that. It's a project team that we work on to move that forward. And um, when we started the strategic plan in 2003, I was like, I do not have time. And I kept running out of the meeting to take phone calls and just like, you know, like, why are we doing this? And I mean, would you say, I <laughs> yeah. think we've grown since we started that like double. When you it's first start crazy. doing it, you're like, oh my God, like I'm not at work doing like work. Uh -huh. putting yeah. up yeah. fires and you, you feel bad that you're taking it. time to yeah. do it. Right. And then after a few years, when it starts to roll and you see like some success from the projects, you realize like it's more important to be there and let other people handle. Do you think you could have done that yeah. without the consultant? Uh, no, 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 no. it's helpful because that. that's, that's, you know, if you find the right person, it just so happens it was our cousin. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 no, it's, qualified. yeah. yeah. Um, At first it's like, what? I didn't even get it. I really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be because like what you're working on, it's still, you know, when we do stuff now, like what you're working on today, generally it's like, you know, maybe a two to four year right. payout yeah, yeah. to see actual yeah, difference. Definitely. So it can be kind of unfulfilling, but you got to just kind of keep the faith that, that you know, you're, you're doing. So, you know, we, we mess things up definitely too. That's not, but if you, you know, if you're not doing anything, then you're just kind of in the, the yeah. hamster wheel. And the first ones we did, it like looks like a kindergartner did it. You know, <laughs> on the website, like now, yeah. ten years later, it's like that's not a whole project yeah. team. Right. Yeah. You know? right. Right. Yeah. We have a question on Zoom, I think. Yes. Um, so Mark Malone is asking, how do you deal with staying all family versus attracting the best talent for growth when some of the most talented people seek ownership? We see family businesses go ESOP, but if that is not an option due to size, what are alternative methods of attracting young talent? Anybody on the panel? I, I've had a lot of experience with that Great. one. <laughs> um, we've had a number of very high qualified, very intelligent um, people join our company and essentially run certain aspects or I mean, I guess I could say silos of our business because there's so many silos in our business um, that, you know, coming in have wanted to maybe not right off the bat, but eventually work their way up into a shareholder position or part ownership or eventually become maybe a franchise owner under our group or whatever. Um, and, you know, we've, we've found ways to create benefits um, after retirement for them as you know so many years worked um will enter into you know a uh, many years after of of a compensation payout and that's kind of been the way we've avoided um actually creating more ownership within the company because kind of similar to the the one that sounded like a disaster with the 28 people you know mm -hmm. at one point we had many um and over the years, we've whittled it back down. And um, coincidentally, that was when I joined the business. Um, <laughs> but um, it's been made into a more manageable position. And my father has done a really good job in finding creative and beneficial ways for those high, uh, high quality talent to also benefit by giving us um, many years of, um, of a home with us and uh, that hopefully can, can work out equally and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't yeah we've seen the creation of sort of long-term incentive plans that um <clears throat> the incentives are on the same as ownership so that you actually structure something so that someone benefits based on growth and profitability yeah. and the things that they would get if they were technically a donor exactly. even if they are not so that's something that businesses will often do and I think it attracts people who sort of 
see that they can really yeah. benefit in a family business, even if they're not. In, in a way, it creates um, a get out philosophy yeah. <laughs> for them. So yeah. um, because we don't necessarily do like a, a buyout um, type of situation that gives them um, at least something that that gives them an out if um, if they need it. So who is that offered to? Is it offered to managers or franchise owners? No, or? it's um, for us. It's it's executive level, um, yeah. long term executive long -term level. Executive, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Go, ahead. Go ahead. So can I just put in a couple of things? I, what I heard was ownership for non-family, and the answer is no. Uh -huh. But thanks for asking. <laughs> <laughs> but there there are options, and though at one meeting I remember very clearly the, the topic of an ESOP came up. And I was told directly to my face, if I mentioned it again, I'd be killed. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was absolutely important to this group. Um, another another family business that I know that went ESOP said it's the worst of both worlds. Mm -hmm. It's it's still being a family business and having to deal with all that and having to get naked in front of the employees. <laughs> so the the concept of and it didn't come up with the concept of a phantom stock. And I think that's kind of what, yeah. what Debbie was mentioning. If that's not, yeah. if that's something you're not familiar with. It's it's creating an opportunity that looks like you're a shareholder, but you're really not. And it's generally based on improvements in the business. And you, can, you get a share of the improvements based on you know, executive level owner. So phantom stock. Yeah. Yeah. We we just, um, this is like in beta testing, but we just rolled it out this, this first part of the year. Um, and we got this from other large flooring contractors around the company, which are part of a buying group that we're a part of. Um, but we we took our project managers from a salary to like a small percentage of the revenue of mm -hmm. their projects mm -hmm. to now we pay them a draw, which is higher than what their salary was. But they get a larger percentage of the profitability of all their projects. Yeah. So it, we did a lot of research to figure out what that percentage is, um, just like at our own numbers and with other companies. So we'll see, it could completely blow up in my face, but <laughs> that seems to be a way, um, you know, like that's true ownership. They're getting a percentage of the profitability right. of all their jobs. So once it's paid in full, so it's everybody's going to be more motivated to take on projects and to build <laughs> projects, finish the projects, get the, get the payments. Cause yeah. that's, yeah. so that's, I mean, I, I think that will work, but we'll, we'll see. You know what? One last thought, and then it looks like we have to close. I, you know, I think sometimes people who are coming into executive roles in family businesses are saying, "But what if there's an exit? Like you actually decide to sell this, and do I gain in that upside?" And there's ways to build in things into contracts there that say, if it were to come to that, you would be, you know, you would be part of the gain. Okay. Yeah. One. Yeah. Uh, real quick, um, I have seen some success with some clients we've worked with who, uh, you mentioned the LLC for property, bringing them in on new ventures that may be partnerships between the existing family business and a key employee to have them some growth and real estate that maybe you know otherwise would just be family business assets. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so okay, much. Thank you all very very much. much. Hopefully, how's the snow up there? Did you get is are you getting your pile up? It's actually not too bad yet. Probably only three or four inches, but I think uh, the winds are coming, so travel. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us virtually. I'm sure it was much yeah. more fun than driving down. So thank you. And um, the composers were very uh, generous and have some door prizes. We also um, would love to have you guys. Give us your input, please, on your surveys, because that's how we build our programs each year. So I only have two business cards, and I have three things here. So if you want to have a door prize, <laughs> we, uh, you can take your name tag, fold it in half, and put it in, or you can give us business cards. <laughs> so, um, anybody who wants to All right, put their name in? <laughs> 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 right. okay, this way. Okay. Less than a Oh, yeah. It's my shameful way to hold these hands. I know. I'm like, I want to do it. 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 I'm like, I want to do
Oh, I know, like whatever. Hey, I always pick. I always. Um, oh, because I always pick when they're doing the swag. I pick like something where they can wear in the showroom that's like nice. That's not comfortable. You know, like I got myself like a almost like a blazer with our. We also have. You all heard. So we have another program for the board of advisors going just after this, but we have to use them for the fan room. Yeah, I was so, anybody, I'm thinking over whether you like it or not. Yeah, I, that was essentially what I was trying to do. Okay, yeah. Plan transition. Yeah. 